we're talking about designing introduction we are we're talking they, sh they need to be simple short as an introductory war game means you're bringing people to other gaming areas or non-gamers for this purpose because of the attraction to get involved we it probably needs to be beams or uh just more than two the separate objectives um it probably needs to be operational or strategic because the f we want the focus to be on um, decisions about strategies, not just playing the mechanics. Um, we think it's probably got to be historical rather than fantasy, which probably means because of the market attraction, probably World War II or maybe the Napoleonics or Romans. Um, the player's role is probably some form of command team aspect. Um, um, and I think that's pretty much where we are at the moment so we need to move on i think to okay we've got this idea somehow of this what i've just what i've just summarized when we come to make this game what what type of components do we need and i know there's we're going to have a bit of discussion about plastic aren't we <laughs> <To be quite honest. laughs> um must you have plastic pieces was a key was a key question do you want, would you like to address that? <laughs> well, I would first talk about Kickstarter poisoning. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Kickstarter becomes very large in uh, the view of, of publishers because it's how they raise money. And also it's how they energize a market. So they want to put games on Kickstarter that will attract the oh shiny crowd, which is the general supporters on Kickstarter. There are lots of exceptions, but... That's when you bring in new supporters. They're often the oh shiny crowd. So you need miniatures. Because you've worked with um, Plastic Soldier Company because they did the Britannia um, mm -hmm. classic. And I had I had resisted for years yeah. having <laughs> in Britannia, but yeah. I finally was convinced that uh, nowadays you just have to. It's interesting because I, I I mean I, I, Kingmaker is entirely different, and, and uh, it is, Gibson's yes. are very very resistant to putting miniatures in it at all. That's interesting. Uh, I don't know whether and are there. I mean, they had originally talked about Kickstarter. I don't know if it's still going to be. That's. Uh, I, I'm not inside their head on that particular one. Um, but they are. They haven't, as far as I'm aware, they haven't done Kickstarter yet. So it may be they're not. <laughs> um, well, I, I can say that because I had two games that I had contracts mm -hmm. signed for with PSC. Yeah. And mm -hmm. after a year, or because of Kickstarter poisoning. Oh, right. Yes. But it may be it may be that the feeling of a lot of publishers is that you you kind of have to you have to lower the risk by doing it through Kickstarter. I mean, well, the I exception think, is GMT, but they have their yes. P five hundred, yeah, and they will not do a game that's not. It, it, I think I think nowadays certainly lots of companies, I mean us included, is surprised there. We we are always looking at, at how the hell we lower the risk because in the old days before the cost of entry went down. You had to be really, really completely publishing as a small company, 5,000 or more copies of a game it was really taking a hell of a risk um, because, well, because of the cost of production, but also because you, you it, really, in terms of whether a game is going to sell or not, nobody really knows anything. Mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still true. Um, it's, it's just so, so difficult. So, I can see the attraction of um, of Kickstarter. I kind of the, the reason I I'm kind of tending towards agreeing here. I'm not quite completely convinced. That's because of the Ming Voyages. Now we we um, kicked at campaigns games, uh, Ming Voyages and the March of Progress. Blatant advertising here. Um, and I was interested particularly during the Kickstarter. We asked the Ming Voyages pieces have have printing on the wooden pieces. Should they, should we print on them now? From my point of view, that was, I thought, well, it seems a bit, I mean, it doesn't change the game. The, the function of the piece pictures on are not. So from my point of view, I thought well, it doesn't really matter to me. It doesn't matter to me as a player or designer whether it has pictures on it. But there was huge support, massive support, because we had printed wooden pieces. They were they were very nice printed wooden pieces. Um, and that 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 kind of changed my attitude, I think, to up of pieces on Kickstarter. Um, and, and having miniatures in the game and plastic pieces in the game. It, it, if you're going to go down that route, 
there would be an expectation, I think. If, if you were going to war game on Kickstarter, specifically, you've probably got no option but to have some, I was going to say gimmick. It is a gimmick, isn't it, really? Some gimmick or other, like plastic pieces in it. Of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be plastic. It could be it could be wooden pieces. It could be something which is a bit more eco-friendly than, than plastic, I guess. Yeah. Recently on Twitter, and I'll try to paraphrase it, um, when people don't have enough, uh, then quantity is very important to them. Mm. Mm. When they have enough, when they have far more than enough, presentation yeah. is important to them. Yeah, sure, and yes. So we're in the age of presentation because there's a vast quantity of work of games and a vast quantity of work compared to the past. So presentation becomes more and more important in attracting buyers. Yes. I mean, there's also a reaction against plastic nowadays, of course, because of the environmental costs. But then again, you can always have minis without plastic, I guess. You can have wooden, wooden mini it's substitutes. Number. Yeah. Um, the, now, on this question, there is another, there is, there is the Undaunted Normandy game. Do you know Undaunted Normandy? No. Now, this is, a, this is a game by David Thompson. Uh, American designer. He used to be in our. He used to be in Cambridge over here. So I played a few games with with um, with David. Um, he's a very interesting designer because he also works for the DoD. So it, so he he kind of has got quite a good technical background in some of this um, stuff. Um, and he, he does. So he does. Oh, he's, um, it's a it's a World War th World War Two atmosphere game. Uh, it's it's tactical. Um, uh, it's um, it's Os it's an Osprey game, so it's it's got a good it's got a good pull. It's actually well, some people have described it. Oh, it's not a war game; it's a deck builder. You know, mm -hmm. but deck building is a mechanic; it's not a game type. Um, and and yes, it is a deck builder. That's true. Uh, it's quite it's quite a clever idea, and it's got a square. You have counters for the people. It hasn't got minis in it doesn't have miniatures it has count it has counters for but the, you for wouldn't expect game. miniatures in a deck builder no true once you true. know it's a deck builder you're not looking for <laughs> well yeah art. yes it's got, it has got it has got good it's got nice art it has got nice mm -hmm. art and it's very it's very well designed it's it's a very popular game and there's a there's a north africa version there's gonna i think there's gonna be other versions that come out as well game i would call that a war game even though it's not i don't know whether i don't know whether in the u.s it would count as a war game because it's, it's definitely not a hex encounter it's it's you know it's, it's central mechanic is deck building does it but have maneuver in geospatial relations yes it does oh absolutely well then it's yeah probably a war game you're, you're actually firing at people yeah it's got death it's got death as well you know you actually take when you when you when you hit something, when you when you kill somebody, effectively, you take a card out and it goes out of the game. You know, so you had actually got. It's, but I suppose because it's abs it's it because it's not a hex encounter, it feels more abstracted. I suppose to a lot of players. Um, see, I would I would say that's probably quite a neat idea for a intro, an introductory war game. It's not simple. Um, in in terms of its mechanics, it's, it's, there's a lot more sophistication when you actually get to play. But what it isn't is it's not at all typical. It is not at all typical. War game be somewhat typical of other war games. Yes, I I would agree, and I think I think from our from our, I think we do want to have something which is more more typical, uh, and also the, the Undaunted Normandy does have that Chris war game. You know, I mean, I, I, you and I can agree that it's a war game, but there's lots of people out there. So oh, it's not a war game. I buy, I play Dominion, therefore I'll play Undaunted Normandy because it's. It's just the same type of thing as that. Well, it, isn't, it isn't, but you know, and I, I, I find when I, when I play when I play against a lot of Eurogame players, right now, that game has got cards in it. It's got you have you have two squads. You have squad A and you have squad B. Now, with Eurogames, you spread out, so they all tend to they all tend to build their deck with both squads in it. Whereas what I do is I say, well, I want to be able to do lots of things with one squad. So I'm going to focus heavily on one squad because that squad and they're doing things all the time. Whereas my opponent is sitting there trying to run two squads when he hasn't got enough focus to, to do two squads. So, you know, it, in sense, it, I, I, mean, I think that's why it's such a clever game that Dave has designed there. People who, who recognize that will do really well. And people who people can play that game over and over again and never realize 
what you can do is thin your deck out on a single squad deck and you'll do really, really, mm -hmm. you'll do really, really well on it. It's focus. Um, that's just an aside. Yeah. So um, I have to have some form of gimmick, some probably plastic pieces. And certainly the track, the current track record is that you, you kind of have to also, which is, which is nice. We haven't really talked about price um, at all. Um, but I think that with an introductory game, you probably have to have a relatively low yes. entry price. Um, so that. Well, here again, plastic. <laughs> number one, you keep down the number of different sculpts, but also you keep down the number of pieces. But in some ways, the sculpts, as I understand, it, you've made the sculpt, you can produce a lot of pieces with that sculpture. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, because you, I mean, with Britannia, there's a lot of pieces in there. Correct. I haven't got, yes, I haven't got the new Britannia. But yeah. Sculpts, yeah. And let's face it, PSC do know what they're doing when they go and they do those, those types of things. Um, uh, we've already talked about uh, simulation versus, I think we're probably not as, I, I personally think it's not as relevant. Um, and we've mentioned it is puzzles. And here we definitely want this to be a, a game. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't a puzzle thing. This has to, this has to, this has to show that I think you were right when you said earlier, this introductory war game has war game, which is different mm -hmm. from the other genres of game like Euro games, maybe other cooperative games. Um, okay. Um, two or three more parts of our discussion here and i'm conscious that we've we, it's been an hour so far um and, and you know we can go we could probably go on for days well, but, uh, you, of course yeah. you can split it up and that's true present it in two parts that's yeah. true that's very true um operative and, and number of players have we done enough on that probably uh, probably only to emphasize that it needs to be a game that partners can play because there are a lot of people who will not play a one-on-one -on -one confrontation who will participate in a partner's game. And I have seen that in my own, I told this originally by somebody else and they're right. So do you mean, do you mean team play one team against another or do you mean team, yeah, yeah, team, team partners? Yeah. partners? Yes. Yes. I, I, I don't think so. It's still competitive. It's still, we're still talking. Um, we're still, we're still talking adversarial. But teams, oh, yeah. I mean, like, like we'll have with Airfix Battles, has things. I, I was quite interested in when we were designing Airfix Battles, the two things that Modifius were very keen to have because Airfix Battles, the introductory war game, is basically um, two player. That's the main focus, is two player. But they were, they were quite keen, very well, almost insistent on we need a solo because nowadays, if you can do a solo, you've really got to do a solo because there is a kind of expectation about solo. Uh, and if you can play partners, you can play two partners against the solo. And so you have a yes. cooperative game. Yes. And, and they had to have, we had to have teams. So we got um, four player, three and four player. Um, I saw somebody was actually doing four player solo, wanted to do a four player. So I think somebody out there in, in Airfix Battles land, we have a massively, we have a massively people in the Facebook group. Hmm. Uh, and people have done, I was quite surprised. People, people out there have done more work on Airfix Battles than I've done. I've got people who've got, I, there's ever a guy, I can't remember where he was from. He was from, um, he might have been from Singapore or somewhere, I think, who'd, he got a whole room and he'd made a diorama. So, I mean, it's just, uh, there, are, there are cards for all, there's cards for French and Russians. And in, in our game, we've, we've really got US. Uh, British and uh, um, and Germans, but the people have done Japanese, you know. And, and there's a World War One version, which is another um, redesigned thing. And there's, a, yeah, there's lots of people have done lots of things with the basic framework of that. Because the thing about Effort's Battles is that you can use them as a framework for other things because they're sufficiently simple that um, you can redevelop them for other for other themes, for other topics. Um, yeah, um, uncertainty. We need to talk about. We need to talk about chance, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, typical war games, I think, have got dice in them. That's what people associate with war games, don't they? Particularly with board and, war games. But it's what puts people off too. Ideally, it might be <laughs> not possible. One version of combat that uses dice and one that doesn't. 
yes i i i mean uh, having having had this having had this split in kingmaker i would agree i mean we <laughs> in kingmaker in kingmaker we have uh, a, a small a small group of players who are very insistent that it's much better to roll dice for whether a noble dies rather than drawing and 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 other people prefer to cut it and nerds twain oh. shall meet apparently so. <laughs> which is I, mean, I i found that quite interesting because if i if you calculate the odds i calculated the odds and the odds are almost identical for both methods, dice and other people swear by the cards. So, uh, yeah, well, we when people use dice, they're not putting their ego on the line. They can always blame the dice for yes, losing. True. Yeah. So I think, but I think for the introductory war game, we have to have uncertainty of some. I think mm -hmm. we have to have. We probably have to have option dice or cards. I think you, you may be right, although that might be that might increase the cost rather a lot. Um, um i mean it depends on whether you use a determin well the alternative could be a deterministic method but then you're talking about much higher levels yeah and also that can be perceived as as more complex because i think people are familiar with six-sided dice i mean he, he, our target audience might even be familiar with other types of dice as well possibly although i'd probably be more more in favor of using six-sided dice um, in case, Definitely. in case of uh, the, the, the multi-sided dice are part of O'Shiny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> oh, uh, was it somebody done dice for the other day? I heard somebody done dice. Kingmaker dice. Did you know you can buy Kingmaker dice? No. I was thinking, but but, but wait a minute, King, Kingmaker Kingmaker uses standard D sixes. You just got fancy little pictures on each side. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so yeah, dice versus uh, dice, dice and or cards. I mean, I like I like I like cards a lot for uh, uncertainty types. But I'm heavily influenced by a game called Sea Strike. I don't know if you did you know Sea Strike. It was back in seventy four, modern naval game, and it had a beautiful um, mechanism for uh, combat results. Basically, a card has got um, a circle in. It's got a circle in the middle. And that circle is divided into four segments, one segment per weapon type. So you've got anti, uh, you've got anti sub, you've got anti surface, um, you've got um, missiles, and you've got something else. Got rid of one. And then because you they and, and and you've dividing it into four sections, you've got a cross in the middle. So you can have you can have, or or you might not have a cross in the middle. So you've got 50 50 is whether you've got a cross in the middle or not. All right. 25% is whether the cross is red or black or there or it's got uh, it's got loads of and, and all the all the individual um, quarters can have the results for that particular um, weapon system calculated pre calculated in the deck so just so just with one pack one pack of cards uh, you've got all of those particular percentages of hits or whatever um, for all those if the basic 25% 50% as well such a clever idea and it came out in 1974 it was ages ago i think if that came out now that would be seen as quite radical i think <laughs> um so i quite like that kind of idea because it's nice and straightforward Play players can understand that i think fairly readily um and you can't just card count you have a couple of system failure cards which allow you to shuffle the whole deck um mm. so I, I mean i like that but you know I, that might be too complex for our introductory games it's not it's not in your face obvious, I guess, which is what we probably want to be. And we should say no combat tables. No combat tables, yeah. That's that's the that's the classic um, putter offerer, isn't it? <laughs> for war games, I guess. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, other thing, other elements of uncertainty can come from um, you don't know much necessarily about the enemy units. You don't necessarily. Um, whether you're going to work, some elements of that could come into this because we we need to have the we need to have the fog of war. We need to have the friction that Clausewitz again mentioning Clausewitz ha, ha, has um, has got there. We need to have that. I, ca I guess we do need to have that in the game, don't we? Really? I think game players in general don't like the oh your orders didn't get is. They don't mind so much hidden information because then they have a chance to cope with that hidden information. But hidden information in a board game usually comes from blocks, and blocks yeah. are not mm. Mm. plastic. However, <laughs> uh, 
if you don't need much in the way of numbers on pieces, <clears throat> they can have numbers. But I won't talk further about it because I've not heard of it before. And I'm not sure how practical it is. Um, an interesting story told me by Andy Lewis of GMT when they were testing command and colors yeah. and they used flats. He wasn't getting much oh, yeah. to 3D pieces, the blocks, even though it's not blocks for hidden information, boom, it took off. Hmm, interesting. That and of course, that's quite a long time ago now. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think the component choice is certainly um, very critical. It's a press game. Um, it it uses wooden it uses wooden meeples effectively well army army meeples for the for the pieces, and some people have said yeah but you could have had you could have had little miniature soldiers for that you know sculpts and then you could have had because the March of Progress basically's got uh, it, um, Napoleon eighteenth uh, century Napoleonics World War One World War Two and he's they saying oh you could have had different sculpts for each of those eras and then that would have made it even better I mean, yeah, the nature of the game would have been exist there there is the pizzazz factor there is the yeah um and it's like when avalon hill came out with the history of the world version and used plastic pieces right. so they had different sculpts for yes. each yes oh right <laughs> mm. it's, it's a marketing issue there for sure um Right. Okay. Um, I so know. I'm not sure how you'd provide hidden information. I think we, cards, cards are an obvious way to have in, hidden information. You don't know what cards the enemy has in their hand. Yeah. I think we need. So we're saying certainty is what we want and limited information. But I, I take your point, actually, that really game players, games players nowadays, they, they need to have a high degree of control um, um or at least most do i mean there's still the munchkin there's still the an element of the playing public that don't care if random things happen um but but i think from our in order to attract our players we we need to give them we need to, they need to have agency and they need to see that they have agency in the structure game we need it needs to be saying to them look things are not going to be completely screwy here which are meaningful decisions and that's part of our if i look back at our part of our definition of wargaming uh was to do with um uh decisions made during the course of those events by players have to be you know they have to have they have to affect what happens so we don't want to have so that it doesn't much matter uh what you what you do it needs to be it needs to be in your face that your player decisions will actually influence the outcome yes uh, right. Um, so um, we need to talk a little bit about what kinds of things we want to happen in the game. What if I know that you? I know that one of the things that you have talked a lot about in terms of war games is it should involve maneuver. Would you like to kind of expand a bit on that? <laughs> well, Winston Churchill and many other people have said um, war involves slaughter and maneuver, and the better the general, the more the and Sun Tzu says. The ideal is to uh, force your enemy to surrender without having to fight them. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much on that side of things, which also is kind of the indirect method as opposed to the direct method. The direct method of warfare is smash yourself together, kind of like a running up with football, overwhelm the enemy. But that is, to me, uh, inelegant and doesn't show what really good generals do. And war games are about generalship, not about warfare. I'm, I'm very certain of that. <laughs> um, so you need to have a game where maneuver is important. That's also true if you don't have very many pieces. And rapidly, it makes it difficult to make the game work well with a small number of pieces. Yes, I'm, I'm glad we mentioned indirect, the, the, the old little heart indirect approach. Yes. I mean, teaching, teaching that, or at least having the ability to do that is... I think quite important. It's uh, professional war gamers are quite are quite keen on. That's what in a, in a lot of, well, and maybe not indirect approach, but certainly alternative approaches to just smashing together is what is what they are looking at when they're trying to do um, 
uh, indirect approaches. Well, um, in World War II, the American Army did the smash <clears throat> mouth direct because we had more people and more equipment and more of everyone want to do that anymore because we don't have so many people and we can't afford to get people killed. So the indirect approach is you're sort of nibbling at, pe at the other side approach. You're accepting attrition. Yes. Yes. I, I, I think we need to, our, our game certainly needs to give people the option for that. It reminds me, I, I was, I was, I was replaying the old, the old La Grande Armée game. Um, do you remember that one? That was old SPI Napoleonics game, 18.5 and the 18.6 and the 18.9. Uh, uh, it was, and, and um, the classic, the classic players out thinking the designer thing happened because in the 1805 scenario, what you're supposed to do as the French, you're supposed to do the, the classic, it's set up for the classic Napoleon surrounding the Austrians at Ulm. Uh, um, to take the Austrians Austria. and Russians beyond Vienna, Austria. yeah, Austria, yes. uh, Austria, yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. Um, but of course, that when you played the game, you realise that's how it's set up. So as the Austri as the Allies, the Austrians and Russians, you, you don't go to all. You, you stay. Well, that's you stay. the problem with Obviously, war games. You, you have stay back. you know what happened. Yeah. Say whatever you want to call it. But what the design up because there's also pressure on the map. The designer says you have to have a certain number of victory points at various stages in order to stop the Prussians coming into the game, you see. So some canny French players thought, hang on a minute, what if we attack the Prussians first? <laughs> <laughs> so they, and they found that actually, if you attack the Prussians first and beat it completely, you get much more of the old style indirect approach because with Prussia out of the way, you can come in from the North or from the West, not just from the West. And that, that was, that was one of those beautiful moments where you think, wow, yes. The designer was horrified, apparently. <laughs> but it actually, <clears throat> I remember, I remember, because um, I played a lot of this, a lot of La Grande Armée with um, a friend of mine from school. And we eventually caught on to this. We played 1805 scenario a lot because we just liked it. it was good. But, but it, it got like, well, we know what's going to happen because there's standard things you do. And then one of, I don't remember which one of us it was, thought, hang on, we, let's just try and see what happens. And that is that kind of revelatory moment. And, I, I, and I, 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 me as a designer now, I'd be thinking, fantastic. That's really, that's really interesting uh, uh, solution <laughs> for them to come up with. How you would do that in, a, in an introductory game, would, I mean, would be an interesting design challenge. You want a lot of introductory games. So they kind of lead you through what you're supposed to do, don't they? There's a tendency towards that at least. Uh, yes. Because you don't want like people to be scared. Of. Video games, yeah, yeah. You don't want people to be scared off, but you do want people to discover these other things, and we, we I think we would have to, uh, have to include. That, that brings up the question of whether your game is specifically about an historical event, or about a group of historical events. In other words, say you were making a Rome game, you would not have to simulate a particular barbarian invasion. Mm. You could just have various barbarian evasions. Yes. Yes. So the hindsight foresight problem. Yeah. But if you're doing a particular battle or campaign like the one you're talking about, then his foresight hindsight is there. Yeah, yeah, true. Mm. So I think what we're what 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 I would take away from that is you probably want to you probably want to have some form of typical situation allows for quite a lot of variety of approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, um, we, we talked a bit about maneuver and we want definite maneuver so there's this whole idea of movement and combat we want i mean we haven't talked about combat which is obviously we need to, we need to talk about combat because it's a military game uh, movement um there are various styles of movement i i, I mean um sequence of play type affairs uh, come in in board in board war gaming i think um board war games tend towards i go you go don't they really typically I think. Yeah, but I, classic games did, <clears throat> yes. And a lot still do. But, but it, action points, for example, you can only move a few pieces it, it, and then the other player can move a few pieces. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of different things. Non-simultaneous combat and, or even Defender can't fight at all. I don't recommend, but you could do it. Yeah, I think it, it, our combat system for this um I think we'd have to go back to our original criteria. This needs to be simple and short uh, and, and readily understandable. 
So, and we're not having CRTs. So, I mean, uh, do you, oh yeah. Uh, okay, shall we, do you like, do you prefer, are you, are you happy um, with dice buckets? Or I, I made a video once called uh, <laughs> just say no to dice <laughs> or just say no to dice buckets. I'm not sure which it was. <laughs> it may have been both. Um, no, dice buckets don't make any sense to me, especially because mm -hmm. I'm afraid a lot of people don't add up. Yeah. Um, I've seen intelligent people roll two dice and count the pips. Yeah, yeah. Because they didn't just know by seeing the dice what the total was. One thing that one thing that surprised me about dice buckets is do do, do most designers really know what they're doing when they're putting dice buckets in? I mean, I played I I played Conference of War Games, which is very clever guys very very experienced war gamers we're the older group of war gamers. and we played a game which was basically kind of arab israeli war one and the combat was a was dice buckets and it was like sixes to hit and i'm the israeli player right like and, I, and i'm thinking to myself this is going to be an absolute this is potentially an absolute disaster this game because yeah, you've given me loads of dice. Yeah, the Israelis get like three times as many dice as the Arabs. Now, I know, because I've looked at the probabilities, that isn't a guarantee of success. And I roll 24 dice and I get one six. They roll six. I think, well, <laughs> I, I, I am not surprised by this at all because I know that is, that you know, that is going to freaking happen. But I played an entire two-player risk game when I was a kid and rolled one six. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, you know, as a designer, you, you should know that you're not providing the Israelis with the kind, if you just mm -hmm. give them three times as many dice. That's not how it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Uh, it can happen. But I mean, you can... should be able to devise a, a combat system that you can resolve it with one or two dice. Yes. I, I tend to use the Valley of the Four Winds combat system because there's no tables and you use two dice and that's that. Remind me of that? I can't remember. That. It has an attack number and a defense number. The attacker takes his attack number and adds a defense number, and he needs to roll that or higher to get a hit. Right. And so yeah. somebody who's hard to kill has a high yes. defense number, plus That's two. That's right. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And that has worked for several games, and yeah. it continues to work. And I'm probably not supposed to say it. No, I do really like the Senate of Four Winds. I think it was a great game. Uh, because, because it had the operational strategic thing in it and it had the tactics and you had different different races different um creatures have got different tactical abilities which is, which is really nice and it had reconnaissance as well um because you have these uh was it magicians or something or somebody who could go a long way you could find things out a long way you go a lot fast a long way and find things out and if you didn't do that you were severely disadvantaged um and that was fantasy of course not um not historical but yeah, we know we can do something like that, and that's what we probably want to do. So we're saying we're, we're saying a definite thumbs down to dice dice buckets, even though they are incredibly popular, <laughs> which is really that's a really frustrating. Well, it's a really frustrating. If you look at the popular games, mass markety sort of games, mm. Axis and Allies, it's a dice fest. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and people like dice fests. I don't know why. Yeah. Um... Yes, in, interestingly, I mean, Undaunted Normandy, which was an example I gave earlier, uh, it, it uses, I think you, you, you roll, you do roll dice, but you're only rolling, you're rolling one dice when you shoot at something and depending on the target. So it's, it's not dice buckets, thank goodness. Um, although you can roll more than, I think you can roll more than one dice. I, I can't remember, I can't remember the particular detail. So yeah. Um, Anything else? Do, we, do you want to say anything else about combat in terms of an introductory game? It needs to be simple enough. So I think it probably does need to be. We would have to make a decision about dice or cards. And and, and again, in the ideal world, there would two, be two different ways yeah. to do it, but that's pretty difficult. I think that probably is difficult. Dice, but, sim but simple and not buckets. Is what if you saying. go up to, to <laughs> Empire's kind of uh, level, then you can have two different methods, yes. dice and... Mm. Um, now, um, I think in, in our in our notes, um, you had indicated um, economies as a potential area to look at. If I mean, I think if there's an interesting discussion to be had about whether our introductory game should be level. If we're talking strategic level, 
by which I mean, how are you going to win the war? Not how are you going to win the campaign, which will be operational. Um, uh, are we, for an introductory game, do we think that grand strategic would be a good idea? Uh, you, you, obviously, you can do very simple grand strategic because you can do things like diplomacy. And I know that's one of your areas where you've done a lot of stuff in the kind of diplomacy area. I don't know whether you, do you consider diplomacy a war game? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, it does. It does. But it's, it does it's pretty abstracted. It doesn't yes. have a lot to do with reality. But it's definitely a war game. And that would be grand, but it hasn't got, it hasn't got an economy. Well, not really. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a zero well, sum it's, game. Yeah. Mm. It's the ultimate economy. Oh, I suppose. Yes, okay. Yes, it has. It's a yes, maintenance okay. economy. It's not an accumulation yes, economy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So, 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 what do we, what do we think the advantages and economics in there might be in our introduction? Well, this brings to mind something that I, I don't think I put on the notes, and I don't think you put it on the notes. Do we want a symmetric game or an asymmetric? Oh game? yeah, that's a good point. If you have a symmetric game, I think you need economy to give some differentiation. If you have an asymmetric game, then you there's a less need less need for an economy. That is but quite there a... you go. If you're talking about a war, you have to have some economy. If you're talking about lower, then you don't have to have one. And there's potentially an additional complication. Um, you could even look at it in terms of, um, well, Hastings 1066 was a really mm. simple game, mm. dedicated game and a more deadly game. And I figured out early on, I needed to have some of the dead ones come back. Right. But uh -huh. it was very, very simplest. If you've got two dead tanks, you can bring one yes. back and toss yes. the other one in the box. <laughs> yeah. The simplest sort of economy. Yes. Really. Um, so if there's a lot of death in the units, you've got to have you arrange it so there's less death in the units. For example, they get hit once and they're not dead. They'd, you'd like steps if it was yes. cardboard pieces. Then you don't necessarily need an economy. So like, like memoir, 44, rather than, rather than bringing units back. I... I um, in terms of the symmetric versus asymmetric, I'm I'm thinking that a, a really critical teaching point is that everything is unique in war. Uh, so I, I I would heavily go for asymmetric myself. I, I don't mean to say it has to be necessarily, but I think there does need to be asymmetry um, uh, because no, no two states, no two combatants are in the same place um, ever, actually. Um, and yet, I, many of the classic games are symmetric, like yes. uh, Stratego and Risk, and so some partly from chess and checkers. Yeah, yeah. So I think so. I, but I, I'm, yeah, okay. So, so I'm being influenced a little bit by my tendency towards simulation rather, rather than rather if, than game. If you have more than two sides, then symmetry doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. Two sides. I've designed symmetric games and asymmetric because they're harder to balance. Absolutely. But they make a lot more sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a person who has played uh, Dave Turtsy's Defense of Procyon Three, which is four-player asymmetric. Uh, uh, it, um, it's, just, it's a sci-fi game. It has um, it, it has teams of two. One is in one one of member of each team is in space with the space with the ground forces. All four have got different combat mechanisms and maneuver mechanisms. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's a it's a fantastic game. You uh, you have to learn it as four separate games because mm -hmm. you know, obviously mm -hmm. you've got complete asymmetry. And um, I mean, when I originally played, I thought the fact that this works at all it works. The fact that this work works well is brilliant. <laughs> uh, it's one of those games where it's a proper it's a proper team game. You can't just fight your bit. You actually and there's mechanisms for which you have to help your team member. And if you don't do that. As part of what you're doing, uh, and I, I've kind of, I well, as part of what I was responding to in playtesting, I was trying to make it so that um, it was less Euro-y and more, more war gamey, with mm. with some elements. The, the problem we had originally, because I think because Dave Turtsy is primarily, maybe primarily a Euro game designer, and I hasten to add, but he has done war games. He did things like well, other war games like um, Days of Iron. Budapest, Budapest Revolt. Um, it has done kind of war gamey type things, but in this the original, the initial versions that I played of that game, 
um, they tended, you, you were in a situation where you had lots of units, but because of the way you, half the time you couldn't use, you, know, you, you only had enough actions to use like half your units, which was kind of, but, but I want to focus. I want to concentrate my units and use them. I don't want to be in a situation where I haven't got enough action to use all that light, all that light over there. They might as well not be there. Um, so he, he restructured to take that into account. And now you've got this properly group your units together, but you do still have to help your, your, your team member. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a clever game. So I'm, I'm definitely in favor of, of the asymmetry. That's for sure. Well, the drawback of symmetry is you're more likely to focus on killing units. Yeah. Than on other objectives. Set up a situation where the players in fact have different objectives more or less. Um, something that, to, to go back to economy, something economy does is it provides an intermediate objective. Like in risk, you know, the more territories you own, the more armies you get. Mm. Yes. So there's an advantage in owning more territories. I mean, I quite, I quite, I mean, I, I'm controversial enough to say I quite like risk <laughs> for its concentration. It's, it's, it is a proper, it's a proper war game. If you don't focus and I, I don't like a lot of the options. A lot of the options allow you to dissipate and, and play suboptimally. Uh, you know, hardcore, separate. Well, okay, you can get screwed by the dice, but then it's a dice game for Christ's sake. But so I, I think that um, it, it, hardcore risk will separate out those people that know strategy or at least operations and those people who don't. Mm -hmm. um, and that's. That's, that's I quite like it for that. <laughs> um, oh, well, oh, oh, can I ask you? A, can I ask you a somewhat controversial question? You know, Britannia. You ever know me to avoid controversy? Well, no, not really. No, Britannia. Do you do you have do you have people who say to you, "Oh, Britannia is just like Risk," and if oh, no, oh okay, oh oh, oh it's preempting. Oh, <laughs> it's a ridiculous. Say suggestion but yes people do say that so and obviously they don't know what they're talking about because <laughs> they, they don't play the games so i wonder what your reaction was to that but yeah i think you've given it really pretty much yes so, yeah yeah risk is a conquest in that way you will oh, lose you will lose yes <laughs> yes i had uh i mean i know it's a bit of a reminiscence but i mean i, I remember playing a game of britannia um a few years ago at bacon because we uh, this is not your bacon which is in San Francisco. This is our bacon in, in Um And I was playing Risk with this group. And I was, I think I was playing, um, I was playing, I think I was playing the Romans actually. And I didn't, I didn't massively attack the Welsh. Um, and they said, oh, you're not playing it right. If you don't, if you don't attack the Welsh, then, then they'll just win. And, 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 and I found in the same group. So they, they had group funk. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the the strategies for Britannia. Somebody coming in from outside with a different strategy <laughs> um, kind of threw them completely. I, I, to be fair, I didn't win. I lost by a couple of points. Almost well, invariably, the Romans and the Welsh make a deal. Yeah. The Welsh yeah. contract the five, yeah. the Romans yeah. submit them, and they go north. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it yeah. works. Yeah. I hate it because it's not something <laughs> like history. And in B3, it won't happen, yes, but yeah. that's what they do in B2. Yeah, I, I mean, I did, I, did take, I did have to say to these girly with the, with the UK Britannia champions, um, um, who, who, and, and you know, that's how I learned how to play. <laughs> um, they didn't really, they didn't really get it, take it on board, I think, but it was fun. I like Britannia. It's good. It's, it, I, I like it because, because of those strategic decisions. You, you can't to make them in relation to what other people are doing, obviously, that you have to do that. And, and it is it's ferociously it's political. It, and it's political as well. Yeah, which is nice. Um, yeah, we were about to go into the victory conditions, which I think is, is, is something we were beginning to talk about, victory conditions, and because and you mentioned just killing units. And we don't, we don't want... I mean, most of the scenarios... Um, are you get points for killing units. You don't necessarily get points for just killing units, but you do get a lot of points from killing units because it's a tactical game and we 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 wanted to keep it really simple and straightforward. Some of the more interesting scenarios actually are, are the ones where, where it's not about killing units at all. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple where you're you get the dossier, you know, that somebody's lost somewhere, or, or you're trying to take a specific position only. And it's not about the 
It's not about it's about the objective, the actual physical the t terrain objective, not about killing units. So you can lose loads and loads of units and uh, and still um, and still win. So um, with other other objectives, and I like your idea of intermediate objectives. Yes, I would like to have some intermediate objectives and simple uh, final objectives. If you have an asymmetric game, then they'd be different for the two players, perhaps. Um, yeah. But definitely not killing other units because that takes it to kind of a, a low kind yeah. of kids level. I mean, the World War II, the World War II stuff, a lot... I, I, I mean, it, 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 it might actually be that this is one of the disadvantages of miniatures games because they do often um, killing you. Well, Memoir 44 has got to take some blame for this because in Memoir 44, virtually every scenario is you just have to get a certain number of flags and flags are got by destroying units. And that's just one of the reasons well, why it's a very, very tactical game. game. You don't have much else to do. <laughs> this is why... I, this, is, this is This is one of the reasons why I like my Mission Command Normandy game, um, where after the game, we have huge discussions about what what was the nature of victory? Who actually won? I mean, I, we deliberately don't usually set hard and fast victory conditions because we're usually playing pseudo-historical scenarios. And we're saying, what you're doing, you're comparing what you did against against what happened historically. And we had a we had absolute classic game, German paratroop battalion, full scale parachute battalion on the eastern front defending a town against a Russian tank corps, right? Uh, the, the parachute battalion had had a bit of armor in support, but they were in a town with engineers and stuff, you know, so it's, it's a powerful unit. The, the Germans said, we killed so many Russians, we won. Uh, and basically my response to that is, these are Russians, you yes. lost, you lost the town. Historic, yeah. Historically, you should have kept the town. Um, there were classic errors that were made, like I think somebody in that particular game uh, put all their anti-tank in one position in the front line. Uh, and, and they got, all got wiped out early. So, that, that, oh, 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 they've got tanks coming in, Panzerfaust here and there. Um, you know, so I like games where it's, where discussing what victory actually means is quite, a good part of the game. So I'm definitely in favor of not just killing units in terms of winning. Sometimes you have to lose a lot of men to win. I like games, and this is only game players develop their own things they want to do. They don't care whether they win. They just want to accomplish this. Like I have a pirates game. Hmm. And one of the things they try to do is capture the Spanish silver fleet, which is very difficult. Or they just want to build up a big pirate fleet. They don't care whether they game or they win the game or not. They're having fun with quite a few players, which is not really what we can do for an yes. instructor war game. I don't think. Yeah. I played a, a pirate mega game, which which basically was that. It was <laughs> the pirate players were basically. Oh yeah, you could attack the Spanish if you wanted to, or you could just go for a big pirate fleet. You know, <laughs> which is all, yeah. <laughs> Conditions, I think yes. Objectives other than just killing units. Killing units is. It's probably going to happen, although the Sun Tzu does, does come to mind. Uh... What, what I really like in a game, and I have a couple of games like this, um, is a game where maneuver is so important that the winner can have be the player, with, right. but they've still outmaneuvered yes. the other side. Yeah. And I do that with uh, objectives, territorial objectives, a lot of them. Right. Yeah. So people have to realize what you're. You have to and understand have to spread what out, consider them all and decide that's, what to defend. That's, that's true. Yeah. Um, good. Um, well, we've almost reached the end of our notes. Um, I think you had you had one other one which I wanted to ask you about. Because this is what did you mean when you were talking about the jip factor? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is something that I and uh, I think it still applies, but never talk about it. And that is. The question of how much skill plays a part in the game, or to put it another way, is if the player is much better than the other, are they very, very likely to win? Or mm. is it about if you was, if you're the really good player, you're getting gypped if you don't win? Yeah, right. a, a new player. 
So an introductory game has to be somewhere in the middle, but where in the middle is another question. Yes. And you know the, the tendency of some non-military games to have catch-up mechanism tension for half or two-thirds of the game and still have a chance to win. That would be a big jip on everybody else. They would be jipped. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there is definitely, that is a definite tendency in, in quite a lot of social Euro games. Uh, uh, well, there are things like Spiel des games. You, you kind of have to have, because there are two things I think you have to have in there. One is you have to have that ability somehow for the, for the parents to make sure that they're giving the opportunity for their children to win without it being obvious that they're throwing the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you have to have that level of cleverness in the design. But also, uh, you, a new player can, can actually win, can have a chance of winning. Otherwise, you're, going to dis- you're automatically discouraging a lot of new players. I mean, it, in, in some ga- of those games, it might not be a huge chance, but it has to be the players have to recognise that they have all got a chance to win, say, halfway through the game effectively knocked out i don't think we have to have that quite so much in a war game because we're trying to we're trying to say it actually does matter what you do um mm-hmm. in a war game it matters you, your decisions you have to actually, pay attention you have to pay you have to pay attention yes i have the, i used to use the when i'm when i'm very tired and playing a year i'll often use and i'll often say that's just because i'm playing the mechanics i'm not actually playing the game Mm-hmm. Just, you can easily go through the motions doing it. I'm taking all my actions, it's fine, but I'm not focusing on what I'm doing. So I'm quite like to lose. If I do that and I actually win, and that's I think that's a terrible game. <laughs> because I shouldn't I shouldn't be just and still win. That's uh yeah. yeah. Even even against new players who are playing paying attention, I shouldn't be. But yeah. Uh there's a whole separate podcast about euro games uh, which i don't know whether you'd be interested in that that's another discussion for another day probably um, um so um thank you factory and i think i agree i think that with an introductory game you have we have to be i think you have to have a situation where an experienced player is more likely to win than the new player if the new player doesn't expect that to happen then the new player playing more yes. games this is this is true yeah yeah. Good. Well, um, I think we've done pretty well so far. Um, are there any other? I mean, we, we've. We, I, th- I mean, I've got. I have got. I have got our notes in front of me. We're aiming to discuss, um, uh, and um, I'm wondering: is there anything else? I better just do a quick summary, and then we can see. Try and make it. I'll try and make it fairly quick. So. Today we're talking about designing introductory war games uh, with Dr. Lou Pulsifer, who is uh, my uh, friend from way back before the Ark. <laughs> um, almost. <laughs> um, I'm uh, six years older than you. <laughs> <laughs> I should explain that actually Lou, Lou was the person who got me into um, designing games for publication. Before I met before I met Lou, I didn't really understand that you could actually get companies to publish your stuff <laughs> and and um lou showed me that that you could not, i owe a lot to to lou anyway we've been talking about designing introductory uh, war games and we think that um ideally they should be simple short they have to be commercially successful uh so marketing is is very going to be very important for war game which means understanding your audience and particularly understanding your territories in the world phase is going to be very important for this probably needs to be not not just a two-player but a multiple multiplayer game even if it's teams it needs, you need to have those facilities possibly also solo to capture more of the market if we have defined we have defined um war games for our purposes here as about generalship not about warfare um and we we think that we're because we're trying to teach more, or at least we're trying to introduce people more to the difference between war games. Uh, we we would prefer this introductory war game to be operational and strategic, so that we can f- players can focus on strategies, not on mechanics. That's quite critical. So higher level rather than 
tactical or, or skirmish level game. Um, the player's role is probably something in the area of command teams, that kind of area. The topic, players is probably one of the most attractive <laughs> wargaming areas of World War II, perhaps Napoleon is perhaps a classical Rome. Um, we touched on fantasy, but probably want to go historical because we're looking more at what is a typical war game rather than um, rather than fantasy. We uh, are conscious that nowadays, if you're going down the Kickstarter route, you've probably got to have plastic pieces in the game. Although I think both of us are to some extent reluctant to <laughs> to go down that route, but low number of pieces, uh, so we have a relatively low entry price. This wants to be reasonably possible um it needs to be a game that can be played by partners in teams there need to be there needs to be uncertainty particularly uncertainty in terms of combat resolution and fog of war but it needs to be limited on players need to know that they are in control of events to an extent to a to a high extent really so for example for combat we're thinking definitely not combat results tables that's far too complicated dice and or cards and the dice are not dice buckets they're a simple um, dice probably with some cards following that same um, role in terms of the history side of things we do want it to be historical but it could be a typical situation rather than, than an actual historical situation that we're modeling um, and with game possibly with some form of simple economy so that we can have easy intermediate objectives for each player and those objectives can be asymmetric and we don't want those objectives to be just killing units it has to be something more substantive than that it could be territorial um, and we would like there to be a situation where where although an experienced player has got more chance to win probably uh, the novice still has to have opportunities that kind of encapsulates what we have what we have reached have we do you think we've missed anything out was that about oh, i'm sure we missed something <laughs> out <laughs> i don't know exactly what I, <coughs> i'm trying to look over the, anything so I, I've in yeah. the last few minutes but uh i'm thinking developed lou that's <laughs> i'm thinking I, I was just thinking that you know pocket i've got this pocket campaign series it's got these nice small boxes <laughs> for war games to be put in uh you know how big is the box? Oh, the oh, the box is about uh, oh God, I don't know. You see, this is the disadvantage of it's not having like that, this is, the dis disadvantage of not having a camera. It's about seven by five inches, if you want that's to use inches, and it's only got a depth of one and a half. So it's yeah, quite yeah. small, not really big enough Talk for about minis. Boards. Sorry, mounted. That's true. I like, I prefer mounted boards myself, actually. But you can't get much of a mounted board into a box that small. No, that's true. I think, I think, I think this box is probably too small. I think probably. Yeah, probably need to, to, to quadruple it. I can it describe the game that I... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's Napoleonics. It has both strategic and tactical components. So there's a board of two or three pieces. So it's somewhat... Uh, geomorphic with areas yeah and then there are different scenarios as to where players start and it was for two or three players use flat pieces with numbers on them yeah. which at the time was acceptable now i'm not so sure not for an introductory war game so uh you would move pieces and i don't think you moved everybody i, I think there was uh, action points in groups so you could move a group with an action point uh, moved if you were in an area with an, the op opponent, then you would go to a eight and a half by 11 uh, uh -huh. X board and there were rules for lining up and so on and fighting. And it was a method that I had used in a space war game. It was not as satisfactory. It's one of the things that put me off. Um, but I used the Valley of the Fan. I believe there was alternate firing. So after everything was laid out, the defender probably would fire first and the attacker would fire one and you'd put cubes on the pieces to indicate that they fired. Um, but as I say, I, I wasn't entirely satisfied with that. And also the combination of the two probably took long. Yeah. Um, and I don't even remember the victory conditions. I think there were 
territorial conditions, essentially, certainly not killing hmm. pieces. Uh, um, there was no hidden information except that you couldn't look under the top. Now, one of the things we haven't said is probably in an introductory war game, there should be one piece per, per area, per, per hex. But I was having areas, so there was lots of room. And then you could put them in a stack, and then the other player could not look inside the stack. But that I mean, talking about that, that, that kind of that one of one, one uh, piece per hex. There's always things like the Napoleonic Twenty series. Are you familiar with, with those? Those are um, well, basically Napoleonic. I suppose they're uh, well. They're mainly focused on on Waterloo uh, campaign one. So it is it is the whole Waterloo campaign. And it's only 20 pieces per side. And it's, it's, like, it's like each piece is a core. So, you know, you're talking chunky stuff. And it, it does have a CRT, to be honest. Um, uh, it's more Napoleon at Waterloo, but at the, the, the high, uh, slightly higher level, rather than division is get up to um, core level. Now, that's quite interesting because, because you've got a core um, and it's, 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 the combat system is quite bloody in that you, you either... Uh, your, your core it can, can be completely removed. Wow. So, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's, you've got to be a bit careful. Um, uh, and that's interesting because it is relatively simple, although, of course, it's got zones of control and things, and it's got quite a big area, and it is a specific historical scenario. So it, I think it's got the simplicity of having only relatively few pieces, or so. um, but it's got enough complexity to appeal to, to um, a grognard a short, it's a short Gronyard game, really, I guess. Um, I, I mean, uh, it's, an, it's, it's interesting because it is quite, it is quite possible, and quite possible to do a small game like that, which you probably wouldn't consider to be an introductory game. Because that, that one has got CRT, it's got zones of control, uh, it's got you know, complications in the zone of control for cavalry and stuff like that. So it's probably got more complexity than you'd want for an introductory game, but it's quite another another really great small little small game is the um, is the seventeen ninety six campaign game, which is actually a hex encounter game, a, a very old hex encounter game. I think it was re reproduced by Avalon Hill, um, and it it is actually almost the same size as our pocket campaign. One of the it's a strategic seventeen ninety six campaign, so it's the whole of that bit. And it's got very few pieces in it. Um, but the decision making you have to to make in that is very is quite deep because it's got the whole you know interior lines exterior lines problem. That's the whole game. It's how you it's how you deal with that. Now whether you count that as an introductory game, I don't know. It's it's not heavily complex, but it's it's a proper historical scenario. I would almost go as far as to say that an specific yeah. historical event. I, I, I that think... would be one of the things to separate it from just a small historical game. Uh, another thing that I just thought of, if you're going to use cardboard pieces, and I could see doing it, they need to be an inch and a half each. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't need to be, yeah. They don't need to be horrible thin things with... That people use tweezers to pick up. Yes. Yeah, you can't do that, yeah. None of your, none of your um, old Stalingrad style stacks <laughs> would be horrific. Yes. Well, I mean, are there any, are there any last thoughts that you would like to um, suggest, Lou, before we, before we wrap up, um, which will be neat, we're neatly wrapping up at about nearly two hours, so that's not well, bad. Shockingly, no. <laughs> well, that's fine. Uh, that, that's good. I think, I think we've had a good. It was a good summary. It was a good service. A good this. So, uh, well, it, it, I think it just remains for me to say thank you to everyone for listening. If there is anybody out there listening to this podcast, um, and at, the, at this moment, I really don't know. <laughs> there may be, and but particularly, very many thanks to Lou for for your time and thoughts about this, and and for the well, interesting and stimulating. Both of us need to kind of think about this designing through introductory war games and the the, the 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 outputs we've got from this and think uh, am i actually going to do this am i actually going to design an introductory war game i'm sure psc yes psc would love something that, 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 that 
either you or I could produce. Uh, if we and can... of course, I, in my situation, I have no playtesting except myself. Oh, right. Ah. Well, I have a bit of playtesting because I've been playtesting Kingmaker, but only on Tabletopia. I, 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 I have got a problem, yes. And, and at I the haven't moment. figured out Tabletopia yet. Uh, I've got a problem at the moment. Charlie doesn't do war games. Not at all. Well, uh, technically, once or twice she played, um, she played um, World, what was it called? Um, the World War I dogfighty game. God, my name, uh, the name's gone completely from my brain. But anyway, the one, um, the, the one with the, the one with the, uh -huh. yeah. God, isn't it amazing? Ask, Your mind goes blank. Ask her why she doesn't play war games. You might get an idea. Well, yeah, she, well, I th a part of that is because um, her her parents were both out in Burma in World War II and kept going on about it while she was young. She they put her off completely. Anything yeah. about war, she thinks it is. Well, she is the archetypal person who doesn't know doesn't know much about history and doesn't want to know anything about history either really which is a bit sad for me being a yeah a, bit of a history buff but you know these things happen anyway i uh, i will i think we should stop here thank you very much indeed and um i hope to see you i hope to see you. thanks lou